This podcast is brought to you by PRSA Learning. Welcome to the PRSA Learning Podcast Series. I'm Steve Lubetkin. In this series, we'll be talking to many of the leaders from around the PRSA network about their views and thoughts on the practice of public relations. Blythe Campbell has been a ghostwriter for eight different CEOs and their leadership teams over a 30-year career in public relations and marketing. She's written memos, opinion pieces, letters to the editor, legislative testimony, white papers, speeches, and more, both as a freelancer and in a corporate setting. As a ghostwriter, she's developed strong relationships with senior leaders and helped them find their authentic voices when communicating with employees, customers, opinion leaders, and other stakeholders. Blythe has presented at regional and national conferences. She's led workshops, and she's been a luncheon presenter for civic and industry groups. Her feature articles have appeared, with her own byline, in local, regional, and national publications. Blythe is the owner of Blythe Campbell Communications, specializing in essential communication skills for executives and emerging leaders. She joined us from her office in Anchorage, Alaska. Blythe, thanks for joining us on the PRSA podcast. Nice to be here, Steve. So I've heard about ghostwriters for books, but how is ghostwriting for executives different from that? Well, as paraprofessionals, you know, we think about we often write for the executives we support, but we don't think about it as ghostwriting. But every time we write a memo to employees or a letter to a customer, you know, that really is ghostwriting. You know, we think we know how to write and that's our job. So we're just going to get the job done and write in our voice. And we really need to start thinking about ghostwriting. The goal of it is that whatever we write is in the executive's voice. So what are the kinds of materials that uh, PR professionals might be ghostwriting for executives? I assume speeches would be at the top of the list. Definitely. Speeches is up there. But there are a lot of written materials, too. So we think about all those memos to employees, you know, the layoff memo, the reorganization memo, uh, letters to customers, message to shareholders in the annual report. You know, you write that every year. It tends to sound the same every year. But we really need to think about writing that in the executive's voice. Opinion pieces for local newspapers is something I've written quite a bit in my career. Legislative testimony, um, we do that for executives. And now really people are looking at, can they write social media posts, blog posts for their executives, white papers, you know, the list is really long. So why is it so important that the ghostwritten copy seem to be in the executive's voice? What's what's the key there? Well, if you look at things like the Edelman Trust Barometer and other studies, trust in businesses and their executives is really low. And I think people are really looking for authenticity um, in the companies and the organizations they deal with. So you don't want to position your CEO as some charming, witty, and intelligent person on paper if they're really kind of a quiet, serious accounting type. You know, if your CEO gets asked to make a TED Talk based on this great um, white paper you wrote and then bombs, you know, that's really our fault as PR people for not um, writing in that executive's voice. What are some of the things that people can do to effectively capture the CEO's voice? Well, you have to really pay attention and not just in listening, but in writing. And so one of the things I do is if, you know, if you're working within an organization, you do have access usually to that person's emails. So I look at those um, and then listen to that person in kind of a natural environment, in meetings and social occasions, uh, when they're talking to other employees and start really paying attention, not just to the content of what your project of the moment is, but how that person writes and speaks. So unusual words and phrases. I had a client uh, I worked with who uses the word ultimately a lot when speaking. And he also uses the phrase positive outcomes in writing a lot. And so while I don't want to put those in there a hundred times, I will make sure that those things that will be familiar to others will be in what I write. And then think about that emotional tone, too. So, you know, what kind of emotional tone does the executive set? Um, I had another CEO I worked for who was spoke very much like a, a motivational speaker or a pastor, you know, very, very encouraging, but almost in maybe 
a too much over the top way. But if you didn't write like that, you know, people didn't see that it was really coming from that person or was authentic. And then the last thing I do is pay attention to the point of view. So does the person tend to talk about we and our and I, or do they write and speak more in the third person, they and it? You know, those are just a few tips. There's lots of different ways to do it, but it's just really tuning your ear to pay more attention um, to those things that make that person's speech and writing unique. So what do you do if you have a CEO who is not a particularly good writer? Well, I think as PR professionals, we're pretty judgmental about communications. You know, we think that's our job. We're the good writers and they're bad writers. But what I always try to remember is senior leaders are in their positions for a reason. They got there for some skill and talent that they have. And I just think it's our job not only to appreciate those particular talents, but then to highlight them. So to help people be better writers in a way that doesn't erase their voice. What do you do if the CEO's messages aren't aligned with the official brand? Is it okay to rewrite those messages to make them align more more closely with the brand message? You know, I've had this question before in workshops, and it always kind of surprises me. I think we need to take a step back. So how did the brand get away from the CEO? You know, there's a lot of talk about brand voice today, and people are putting in their brand guidelines, you know, this is our brand voice. But if those decisions are so far away from the CEO that he didn't get the message, I think we have to now, as PR professionals, say we have a new project, and that is to communicate the new brand to the CEO in a way that helps that person um, internalize and live it. So, you know, I think the the question, how do we, you know, are we going to rewrite somebody who's off brand? No, we're going to help someone understand that brand and then mesh that CEO or that executive's um, communication with whatever this brand decision has been. It sounds like that might be a bit of a challenge. Well, I think so. And, and, you know, I just, I have seen so many of these branding projects be done totally in isolation. So, you know, the marketing department or the ad agency is making brand decisions and they're really not looking internally to see if that brand is already something that exists in the organization. So, you know, I I do get really nervous when people say, you know, the CEO is just not on brand. You know, the CEO is your brand in a way. They're the face of your company. What happens when you have a, a number of facts that need to be checked in a project that you're ghostwriting. Whose responsibility is that? Do you assume that what you're being given is, has already been fact-checked or do you have to go back and do another round of fact-checking? Well, I think it's just really important to understand that up front. So if you're ghostwriting as a freelancer, you know, I think people need to have a written agreement. And one of the things in that agreement needs to be who's responsible for fact checking. If you're doing it internally in an organization, I would just say you need to independently check material facts. So, you know, some of us as PR professionals have worked in public companies and we we are used to that concept about material information, you know, financial information, um, facts about future plans, those kinds of things I think that we should independently check. I always made sure I had a really good relationship with the finance department because a lot of the things that appeared in the executive's uh, writing or speeches were financially based. And I always had them double check all those things. But as long as you have an understanding of who's responsible for it um, up front, that's the most important thing. So let's talk a little bit about some of the pros and cons of ghostwriting. What are some of the, first, the bad news, the pitfalls in executive ghostwriting? Well, I've been in the position in the past of writing something I didn't believe in for somebody I didn't particularly like. Haven't we all? Yes, exactly. And that was a really uncomfortable project. And at the end of it, I just said, I can't do that again. I think you you can't ever put yourself in the position where you think you're misleading the audience, um, or even that, that you um, disagree with the executive in a fundamental way, and, and you're not going to say anything about it. You're just going to go ahead and write their words. So that's something that, you know, 
you can get into. I think the, the biggest thing for most of us as PR professionals who think we're great writers is if you have an ego, it can be hard to keep quiet about something brilliant that you wrote, and, you know, and it's got the executive's name on it. I remember one time I um, told my kids, I said, you know, I've, I've got this the, this opinion piece in the Sunday paper tomorrow coming out. My my daughter was about eight at the time and she ran to get the newspaper and and opened it up and she says, I don't see your name anywhere. And I said, no, it's this one right here. She said, how can you let somebody else's name be on your thing? Well, you know, that is the job of a ghostwriter. And um, I've been asked before, well, how do you build a portfolio as a ghostwriter if you can't disclose that you're a ghostwriter, well, it's really hard. Um, sometimes you can get client permission after the fact, um, but making a living as purely a ghostwriter is tough because you don't have clips. So that's the uh, downside. Let's talk a little bit about the upside. What are some of the benefits of being an executive ghostwriter? Well, in I've worked for about eight CEOs as an internal employee, and it's really rewarding when you develop that strong relationship based on trust with a person. And so that first writing project for an executive is really scary. You know, there you've been called up from four floors below. Um, you're listening really hard to what it is they want. But over time, when you do more and more work with that person, you really get to understand them as an individual, you kind of understand their hopes and fears, what they're most concerned about. And then as you write with them, you can help them be a better communicator. You know, you're not correcting their grammar and spelling in the instance. You know, you are helping them understand how their communication is landing, what people are thinking about it. You're asking questions like, well, how do you think this audience will see that point that you're making. And so that to me is the is the most rewarding thing is to help someone truly communicate authentically, um, even if they think they can't. And of course, you know, one of the benefits to being a ghostwriter is, you know, it's just part of our jobs as PR professionals and you make money at it. What are the things that people need to keep in mind in order to ghostwrite ethically? You want to do this in a, with, with some standards and the code of ethics and professional standards of PRSA is important to most of us who are members. What's, what's the uh, ethical guidelines? There? Well, I think the first question is disclosure. So we have seen um, a certain very famous person leading our country, you know, has had quite a few ghostwriters in his life. And many of them are dishing to the press about things that they learned during those projects. I, you know, I find that highly unethical and depending on what I guess their non-disclosure agreement said, but being, understanding disclosure is super important. So, you know, are you going to get co-author credit for something, you know, for a, a big piece, you know, a, a, a white paper or something, sh you know, should you have co-author credit if you're writing a good deal of it? Um, does that person ever want that disclosed? So we talk about the portfolio again. Um, so you really need to understand how much your client is willing to have you disclose that you worked on that project. And I think the other thing is, is approvals. So it gets really easy when you're in an organization and the CEO says, oh, it's the message to shareholders. You know, we've written it 10 years, just go write it. Um, you know what I like to say, you know, you know what I want to say in here. And then they never look at it. I think you always have to push for approval on every single thing um, that you write for a client. You know, always get that final sign off before you publish. And that actually brings up a, you know, not a, a question about ethics, but approvals. You know, I find that in a large organization for an important piece, like the message to shareholders or like legislative testimony, there's quite a few departments that want to weigh in on it. And that is a real danger in losing an executive's voice because the legal department looks at it and the accounting department looks at it and maybe the HR department looks at it and every single person turns on track changes and redlines the heck out of it. And by the time you're done, there's not a shred of your executive's voice left. Um, that's something that I think is really important to um, take control of that process so that doesn't happen. Blythe Campbell is the owner and president of Blythe Campbell Communications. She joined us from her office in Anchorage, Alaska. Blythe, thanks for being with us on the program. 
All right. Thanks a lot, Steve. Thanks for joining us on the PRSA Learning Podcast. If you have comments or suggestions, you can email pd at prsa.org. For everyone at PRSA, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you out there on the net. Take good care.